Good evening, everyone. Tonight, as you know, we're in this beautiful auditorium. I like that we're in an auditorium because an auditorium is a place designed for listening. And listening is at the core of what I'm going to be speaking about tonight. So to get us started, I invite everybody to listen carefully to the sounds in the auditorium for about 15 seconds. And you might find it easier to focus if you close your eyes. Okay, thank you. Now I'd like you to contrast what you just experienced with what you heard when you first came in the auditorium this evening. Then you probably heard just a lot of random sounds, unless you were engaged in a conversation with somebody. You see, there's this important difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is one of our natural senses, but listening requires focus and attention. And because listening is intentional, we can either use it when there's something we really want to listen to, like a good story or an important conversation, and we can choose not to use it when there's something we don't want to hear, like my partner, Glory, telling me to get off my computer and come and do the dishes. But listening is more serious when we're in a conflict with somebody and even more serious if we're engaged with an enemy. Now, as we grow up, we develop patterns of communication, of listening and not listening, speaking and not speaking, that we mostly learn from our families. These patterns are very difficult to change, and we don't see the problem until we end up in a conflict or a dysfunctional relationship, and we don't know how we got there. So what's the remedy? Well, back in the 1980s, I was a business manager at a retreat center called the Ojai Foundation. I was a rather uptight, sort of stressed out English kid. And not only was I uptight and stressed out, but I had very severe bronchial asthma. Now, one of the things they used to do there, and still do, is sit in a circle, pass an object called a talking piece, and tell personal stories. Now, I, to be honest, I thought this was the biggest waste of time ever. What was the benefit in sitting around and telling stories? I thought we should all be working more. I mean, I was the business manager. But the thing was, counsel was what was done there, and so I was obliged to participate, even though I was very resistant. It took me a while to discover that my resistance was really due to feelings of shame and grief about the state of my health. And these feelings had been stuffed away since childhood. But when I began to talk about them in council, I noticed that my lungs started to improve. Now this was amazing to me. I would never have guessed that there was a connection between my physical health and expressing feelings. You know, I had a degree in electronics, uh, not psychology. There's this wonderful quote in the apocryphal Gospel of Thomas, where Jesus says, if you bring forth what is within you, what is within you will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what is within you will destroy you. Strong words, but they were very true for me. Counsel gave me a place 
to talk about the things that were inside of me that needed to be spoken. It wasn't therapy, but it was very therapeutic. Um, what is counsel? Well, very simply, counsel is the practice of listening and speaking from the heart. It derives from the ancient tradition of storytelling, when humans, early humans, would sit around the campfire and listen to stories, stories about the origin of the tribe, where the good hunting was, um, what those lights in the sky were. In fact, research shows that our brains are biochemically wired for stories. We call it a practice because it's something we need to do regularly. We recommend you do it once a week. You can look on it as like a listening workout. And I use the term speaking and listening from the heart. The implication here is that we move from head thinking to heart thinking. Now, this sounds strange, doesn't it? We don't usually associate thinking with the heart. Back in the 1920s, uh, the famous psychologist Carl Jung visited the Hopi out in Arizona, and an elder said to him, you know, we think the white person is really crazy. The white man is really crazy. And Jung said to him, well, why is that? And the elder said to him, well, the white man thinks with his head. <laughs> um, and Jung said, yeah, but how do you think then? And the Hopi elder said, we think with our hearts. You know, this could account for how crazy our world seems at times. Listening also has survival value. If you think back, when we were sitting around the fire, the more closely we could listen to the experience of others, how to hunt dangerous animals, which plants were safe to eat, the odds of our survival were greatly increased. And the same is true even today. How many of you remember your parents' advice about how to cross the road? We could all be sitting here tonight because of that advice. When we sit in council, we're invoking this ancient tradition that I just described of listening and speaking from the heart. We sit in a circle, and we sit in a circle, we're all equal in the council circle. We're just sharing our human experience. There's no hierarchy, okay? There's often a center, and in the center is a, a candle, not all the time, but quite often, and the candle reminds us of the, of the fire. And there's something from nature which, re which reminds us of our connection to the natural world. And very importantly, there's an object called a talking piece. The talking piece signifies who is the speaker. And it's the job of everybody else to listen attentively, even devoutly, as the Quakers would say. It's this attentive listening, this devout listening, that helps us develop empathy or heart thinking. And this is one reason why counsel has really taken off in the Los Angeles schools, because it's so closely related as a part of um, emotional intelligence. Council is in, I think, 15,000 students are now sitting in, in council weekly. And it's used in businesses, social service organizations, even prisons. Now, one of the places that council has had a very important influence on my life is in my relationship with my partner, Glory. We met about 12 years ago at a party, but I didn't want to just date somebody that I was attracted to. I had done that before, and it wasn't successful. This time, I wanted to start off on the right foot. So, second time we met, I fixed her dinner, and afterwards, 
asked her if she'd like to try something different. I had arranged a space. <laughs> I had arranged a space with um, two cushions on the floor, um, a candle, a small vase of flowers, and my favorite talking piece. And then I explained about counsel, and then we sat and told each other about ourselves, what we were looking for in a relationship, what was important to us. And by the time the evening was over, we were really both hooked. Now she loves to tell people, what's more seductive than a man that wants to listen to you and share his feelings? <laughs> Guys, you should take note. <laughs> now, the only relationship advice I got growing up was from my dad, who liked to say, women can't live with them, can't live without them. Not terribly helpful. <laughs> when Gloria and I started living together, we got into the, you know, all the kinds of conflicts that all couples get into. After all, we came from different traditions, different families, we had different ways of doing things. But fortunately, we had two very good mentors. Another couple who view relationship as a path of spiritual growth. They taught us to stay in the fire of conflict. Instead of stuffing the feelings away, instead of acting them out, as I had done when I was younger, they taught us how to stay with them. And by learning how to stay with the feelings, it allows them to come to the surface and be explored. Now I could ask questions. Why am I feeling this way? Where did I learn this behavior? By doing this, the feelings themselves became less scary. And the vulnerability I felt by opening myself in this way became less threatening. In fact, the vulnerability became a doorway to a deeper relationship, a, a more loving, deeper relationship with glory. Now, Glory is a marriage and family therapist, and she had carried a dream of teaching couples how to do just this, how to create this vulnerable place with each other. And so we developed a process called Counsel for Couples, which is essentially what we did on that second date, set aside undisturbed time to listen deeply to each other. And if conflict arises, then explore it. Don't stuff the feelings, but explore them. I'm a great fan of the poet Rumi. One of his poems contains the following words. Out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there's a field, I'll meet you there. It's this field that he refers to that we endeavor to create in council. Back in 2001, I was invited to introduce council to groups in Israel. My particular interest was to bring Israeli Arabs and Jews together in the council circle. Very often I would start a Jewish Arab council with by asking each participant to say their name, where they were born, what their lineage was, track it back as far as they could go, and then tell a story about one of their ancestors. Whenever an Israeli Arab or Palestinian would speak, there was invariably a story about the Nakba the catastrophe, the time during the Israeli War of Independence in 1948, when 700,000 Palestinians became refugees. And so often, 
when a Jewish participant would speak, there would be a story about family members murdered in the Holocaust. At which point, the grief and loss of both peoples is right there in the center of the circle. At, this, at that time, it's possible for heart thinking, in that vulnerable place, it's possible for heart thinking to emerge, for to move beyond right doing and wrong doing, and for peace to arise between people. As President Obama said recently in Jerusalem, peace must be made amongst peoples, not just governments. That is where peace begins, not just in the plans of leaders, but in the hearts of people. So in ending, I invite you to imagine a world where listening is highly valued, where we take the time to be with and listen to those we care about, our partners, our children, parents, friends, colleagues, and especially our enemies. Allowing ourselves to enter that vulnerable place is the beginning of wisdom, and our future might well depend upon it. Thank you for listening.